Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop here, and today we're going to have a talk about film props. So, historical film props, fantasy film props, but ones which are about, you know, sword and sandals, as it's known in the, in the business. So, uh, medieval weaponry, basically. Now, I make very accurate historical reproductions, museum-grade stuff, and that's my livelihood. But the other side of my livelihood that you might not know is that I also do film and TV props, uh, weaponry, basically. And I've been doing that for 25 years. So I do know a little bit about the industry. Now, I watch lots of YouTube videos where people are talking about films and the props that are in them, but they don't really understand uh, how those decisions have come about. So this really is just to explain how some of the decisions are made when you are making film props. Now, the thing is, I too love history. That's, that's why we're here. We're all here because we love history and we love weaponry. That's it. Now, when I sit there and I watch a film, you know, I'm just like you guys. I sit there and I go, oh, that helmet is 200 years wrong, or they didn't have a bow like that. Why is Robin Hood using a recurve and not a, a long bow? Whatever it may be. But there are decisions there that I, as a viewer, am not party to, and you, as viewers, are not party to. And we're going to have a look at some of those, some of the ones that we don't understand, but I'll give you examples, but ones which explain to you why choices are made. And, and these are things that we can all understand when they're explained. Well, when you're doing a historical prop, the devil is in the detail, it really is. So you've got to make the overall thing look, look, look right, but you've also got to make the cross guard on a sword functional, or you've got to make the pommel not too heavy, or whatever it may be. All of these details count, because even if you don't fully understand what's going on with the sword, you, you kind of get the feeling if it's right or if it's wrong. So you've really got to strive to get it right. Now, I think in you know, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, people were less concerned about that. But now in the dawn of the internet, that knowledge is at everybody's fingertips. And so there's lots more people who can say that's not right. Now, let's say there's 100 million people out there watching a film or a series. That's 100 million opinions of what's right and what's wrong. And I can tell you now, they're not all right, even the ones who all think they are. So there are lots of rights, okay? But there are also definitely some wrongs. So if an actor can't hold it, or if the uh, mould department can't replicate the prop that's been made, those are wrongs. If it causes problems for the cameras, that's a wrong. And it doesn't matter what we may think about it, it can't be used, however historically right it is. And I suppose the second point that I'd like to make is that we all need to get off our high horse. We, we are not making a documentary when we make these historical films. We are making entertainment. Nobody goes to the cinema for a blockbuster on Corinthian columns in ancient Greek. It doesn't happen, all right? It's not entertaining. That's education. Very valid, but not when you want to make a lot of money at the box office. So we need to produce things which are entertaining. And that means that realism sometimes needs to get stretched a little bit. Now, admittedly, uh, annoyances and diversions are one of the main things that really annoys people when you're watching film and TV. And one of those primary causes for those diversions, those annoyances, where things have changed or they're not as you'd expect them to be, is copyright. Now, let's just say you take the example of a book. The book is written. Successful book. Now, he sells the rights, he, she sells the rights to that book for a comic strip. Now, somebody's bought the rights for that comic strip and they design the visualization because of course it's not there in the book and the character looks like this and he carries swords that look like that and a bow that looks like this. If you then, if the author then sells the rights to that book to a film for instance, that's a different company to the comic book and because it's a different company to the comic book they don't earn the, own the rights for how it looks. So the fact that you've got a double-headed eagle crest on a shield in the comic means that absolutely specifically for copyright reasons, you cannot have a double crested eagle shield in the film because you're breaching copyright. You are taking the designs that another company has done. And that means you have to make changes. And there's no choice about it unless they buy the copyright off the comic company as well. And the same is true if you do television or film or comics or video games. The copyright is owned by different people and the look needs to be different. Now, film and TV, much the same really, and video games are interesting. They're both in many respects the same, that they're constructed fantasy. You can manipulate things with computer generated imagery, CGI, you can uh, make props how you want them to be. But, and here's the big difference, a film you are still constricted 
by, for instance, a character, how he moves, what length of a spear he can pick up, um, how that interacts with the wall that's right next to him. Computer games are not like that. You want it, you got it. So in a computer game or a film, you want a pump action crossbow. Well, you can do that either way. It's not a problem. In a film, you want a long sword with a very pointed tip. That's a problem. No problem for a computer game. Picture the scene. Two A-list celebrities. They're all dolled up in, in their plate armour. They're just about to enter a battle on the field of Agincourt. Now, two noblemen, nicely done. They're going to be wearing pig face bassinets, right? First thing, pig face bassinets look kind of stupid. Secondly, they cover the face completely. You can't see the very expensive actors that you've just hired. You can't hear properly what they say, unless it's done historically inauthentically. You cannot see their eye movements, the way their faces are working. So basically, what you're going to have for 25 minutes of action sequence are two guys that you can't see, you can't read anything from their face, you've just got blank steel, stupid looking uh, visors, with two guys going <laughs> That's all you're going to get. Historical accuracy is out the window immediately, right? So they're going to be wearing open face bassinets. That's the first thing that's going to happen. You can see who they are, you can do everything else. Did they ever do that? No. Historical accuracy, gone completely. Gushes of blood. Ridley Scott loves these. I scratch my arm with a pin, <laughs> blood everywhere, right? Doesn't happen, but it's part of the style of his films. Do we love them? Yes, we do, right? Is there anything wrong with that? Well, yeah, it's completely inaccurate, but it's also right because that's what we want. Coming back to Agincourt then, again, as an example, uh, Sabaton, so the very pointed armored shoes that guys wore. Historically accurate. Yes, a little bit earlier, but anyway, the point being, historically accurate, yes, they are. Health and safety hazard, it's like walking in flippers. Absolutely. They also look really uncool. No A-list celebrity is going to wear those. And then think about the colours and the decorations. So I've just got a prop here. So this is a scabbard that I made, uh, dated mm, early to mid 14th century. It's covered in flowers. Nice little floral decoration here, very, very bright, very lurid. You put that into a film and the viewers are going to be going, oh, he's got flowers on, oh, oh, what does that mean? You know, and they're going to be questioning all sorts of things. It'll distract from the film. Put them in a fairly plainish scabbard, maybe with a little bit of flouncy decoration on it, a bit of shininess. People love it. Great. A scabbard that is covered in flowers, no good at all. Historically accurate, perfect. And then we come to the creative choices that are made. So as a maker, I put my particular style and my knowledge into the, into the pieces I make. But also, I need to have input from a lot of other people. Now directly, well, indirectly usually, the director, through the art director, will have an input into what I do. The armourer, uh, costume perhaps, very often the actor as well. Uh, and various other departments. So, and stunts actually, very notably. So these people all have requirements that I need to fulfill. And so what I'm able to do changes from perhaps what the perfect 14th century, 15th century sword might be. Suddenly I've got some restraints that weren't there before or not there in history. So you have a large group of people, all of which have an interest in putting their two pennies worth into what you're making. Not in a petty way, but because they all have requirements and it has to fulfill everybody's requirements. So if the camera guy comes to me and asks for a change. I can stand there and I can have a discussion with him and I can argue my point and I can explain that in history this wasn't the case and so on. That doesn't alter the fact that everybody is now standing around and at $200,000 an hour overtime or whatever it is, people are looking at me to make a decision and to sort something out. Now I can argue my corner at $200,000 an hour or I can just accept that a change needs to be made. I make the change and we all move on. Sometimes these changes are made, frankly, on a little bit of a whim. We're all human, we all like to have a bit of input into these things. But actually everybody's grown up on set, they all understand the money that's involved in delays. So it's really not about that, it's about changes that were not expected. So let's just say uh, the camera comes along and says actually that pattern there on the costume is causing my camera to strobe. So can we lose that pattern? So they put another piece of fabric over the top of that. That's now changed the, the appearance and the colour of the costume and the prop that I have done that sits over that now 
stands out and looks garish as an example. So I now need to change the colour of that and then because the colour has changed the way the shadows work are a bit different so I need to lift the prop up so I need to add another strap onto a scabbard or something like that. These things happen continuously and you can't foresee them and it's not really anybody's fault it's just the nature of the industry that we're on. It's creative, it's all subjective. We want it to look good. We all want it to look good. So changes happen even when you can't foresee them. So at the end of the day, you make the change that is required from the department that needs the change made. It might not be what you would choose to do. It might not be what you did originally. But the bottom line is, it's work. It's what needs to be done to get the job rolling on. And if you're not racking that overtime bill up for everybody, bonus. Now the thing is, you and your opinions are also important. You are the consumers. But don't forget, actually, you have to pander as a film company to, to the masses because you know you guys out there you one million of you who happen to ever stumble across this film whatever it is you're informed okay you know what you're talking about and so you have a great you know relatively good understanding of what's happening on screen in front of you the other 99 million people don't uh, but they're the people you need to pander to because they're 99 percent of the money but when you pander to the masses you have to give them what they want you have to make people fly backwards when they're shot baddies wear black Longbows Creek, peasants are always dull, they're not bright. These are the things that are needed in a film to portray the message easily and smoothly and without, might annoy you, but without annoying the masses because for them it would jar. Now, you might be happy to avoid these cliches, but you might not. But again, remember, it is not a documentary that is being made, it is entertainment. All of these conflicting requirements from the various interested parties, the uh, the director, the art director, sets, props, costume, armourer, lighting, camera. They all have a bearing on how the weapon is going to be designed. We're not party to those decisions when we're watching the film, so it's very difficult to actually look at what they do and say, oh, well, that's wrong. Well, you know what? If it works, then it's right. That is the point. Now, we'll take the example of a long sword. So we have got ourselves here a classic late 15th century longsword based on one of the Royal Armouries. Now for close-up work I make a, a sword like this. This is not the sword that actors fight with. All right? What they do when you're fighting, a fighting prop, is you take this sword and you mould it in rubber and they're very very good but they are rubber swords with a carbon fibre rod up the middle to give them some stiffness. Now if we look at the point on this, a classic 15th century pointed longsword. Looks great, historically accurate, brilliant. You can't mould it. Well, you can mould it, but as soon as you start fighting with it, the tips break off. And if you reinforce all the way to the point, then you end up with something that's actually very dangerous. So what you need to do is, I'm just removing a bit of material here. You see, I've just put it a line there. That is the kind of tip shape that you inevitably end up with of one form or another. So I'll just move that close to camera. So you can see there that I've completely blunted off the point, right? It needs to be like that. And as well as moulding, there's all sorts of other issues that need to be considered. So we've got our nice long sword here. If the blade's too long, it starts interfering with ceilings and, and rigging on ships and woods and things like that. The handle, even if it's a single-handed sword, the handle needs to be long enough to get two hands onto. The reason for that is that it looks good for action sequences. So if it's a single-handed sword, you want the guy to be able to put two hands on it for that extra hard blow or whatever it is. So you need quite a long handle on it. Now very often, the blade needs to be short enough that you can wear it in a back scabbard. And it's like, oh, back scabbards, I hear you say, why back scabbards? Why do they do back scabbards? They never were around in history, or basically not. They don't really work. What is the point of them? Well, if you consider an action sequence of a, a guy jumping on a, a horse, for instance, it's pretty difficult in a longsword scabbard that's dangling by the side. Again, they just get tangled when he's running through doorways, when he's going past a table in a marketplace. Whatever it is, longsword scabbards are difficult to wear. They're always jingling about, they cause continuity problems because they settle down in a different place and then costume get annoyed. Back scabbards. So the scabbard is worn, the sword is worn, on the back and that way 
it always stays exactly where it's supposed to be, no continuity issues. There's, there's no action sequence issues as long as the, the handle is not too high above the head so you're not tangling through things. They just make life a lot easier. They're very difficult to draw, but actually you can get around that in film. It doesn't matter too much. So back scabbards are the absolute darling of, of films, whether it's historical or not, but especially so in fantasy. You get other weird little things, like uh, the design has to be in sympathy with, with the character. So if the character's rough and crude, then the sword will be a, bit, a little bit rough and crude. And the fact that blacksmiths, essentially village blacksmiths, didn't make long swords is neither here nor there. It needs to look like a village blacksmith made it, then that's what you do. You make the village blacksmith the maker of the sword, and everybody's happy about that. It's a bit less restrictive when you're making weaponry for fantasy films or historical fantasy films, because you can take a little bit of this, you can take a little bit of that, you can put it together, you can have this, and, and it's all great. But inevitably, you guys out there will be going, and you don't know about all the restrictions, but nonetheless, you'll be going, well, that's the wrong sword for hunting orcs. And it's like, well, okay, great. Well, the last time you went hunting orcs, right? When you went hunting orcs, what was the sword that you took? Because I'm reckoning you can't answer that question. So it's very difficult to say what the right orc hunting sword is. Is it that one? Well, you know what? If that's the one it needs to be because of all the other restrictions, then that is the perfect orc hunting sword. And the last point I'm gonna make about why film props don't always seem to deliver what you expect them to deliver. One of the big problems is differentiating between groups of people. So if you think of something like The Last Kingdom, so you've got Saxons and you've got Vikings. Well, they look pretty similar. They dress pretty similar. They look similar. They fight in a similar way. Their cultures are, you know, relatively similar. They both have round shields. Now, when you've got a bunch of guys who are beating the hell out of each other with swords and spears, you need to be able to differentiate in that fast action that you always have in these battle sequences, who who is. So some have round shields, some have square shields. Square shields, oh my God. Right, nobody ever had square shields in 10th century England. Didn't happen. But nonetheless, it's required to just keep the thing running. And then again, uh, Robin Hood, there's a sequence early on where some French ambush some English. Uh, Robin turns out, saves the day, lovely. Now the French are shooting black fletched arrows, the English are shooting white fletched arrows. Nobody shot black fletched arrows, not, not in any quantity anyway, there might be in the odd, oddball. The reason you do it is so that when you've got arrows flying around, you know who's shot what arrows. It's just simple la visual language that just helps us all understand. Historically accurate? Not remotely. Required? Yes, absolutely. Well, hopefully this film has been useful to you in explaining some of the choices that go into historical props and why things end up as they are, really. So what I'd say is next time you watch a historical film, sit down, calm down, relax and just enjoy it for the spectacle it is because you can't know the choices that have molded the design of that film. My last word on the subject is the 13th Warrior. If you're not familiar with it, it is a grand fantasy Viking epic. Uh, fantastic sets, some good historical accuracy, um, a run along story that goes at a hell of a pace. I love it. The gladiatorial helmets, the conquistador helmets, not so good. I still love the film. I enjoy it for what it is. Thanks. <laughs>